It's May the 4th, 2021, and coming up on this week's episode, we start as we always do with Formula One, looking back to the Portuguese Grand Prix and win number 97 of Lewis Hamilton's incredible career. We'll also, of course, look forward towards this weekend's Spanish Grand Prix. There was a Spanish Grand Prix last weekend as well. That, of course, taking place for MotoGP at Jerez. And we will look at everything that happened there. We will look at the first round of the World Endurance Championship season, the Spa Six Hours. IndyCar had two races in Texas. NASCAR was in Kansas. And there's a little bit of Super GT to throw in as well. And it's all coming up this week on this week's episode of This Week. Hello then folks and welcome back to the show, welcome back to my channel, thank you so much for your continued support and your comments and your questions for the merch sales, uh, which are still going so strong, I can't believe it, a massive thank you to all of you for that, um, and as we've said and as I continue to say, the percentage of every sale goes to charity, so thank you. Um, if you haven't already, please hit that subscription button, please ring that notification bell so you will know. Uh, when the latest of these comes up online and anything that we do and produce comes up online. Um, welcome also to the glamour, the glitz, the glory of Formula One, my hotel room here in, uh, in Barcelona. We uh, travelled from Portugal yesterday and we have to kind of stay inside our hotel room unless we're going to the track, so I might go to the track tomorrow um, because, yeah these four walls are closing in pretty quickly. <laughs> but Spain is getting back to normal out there. It's great, I can see it out of my window. Um, and it's wonderful to be back here in Spain, wonderful to be back at a track. Of course, where we were supposed to be having pre-season testing, but we didn't. Uh, I don't know if you can hear the wind howling outside my window, but it's pretty gusty, pretty strong. So I don't know how much of an effect that will have on the weekend. Uh, here in Spain. We're going to start though by looking back of course to Portimao, to Portugal and the Portuguese Grand Prix and once again, and we'll get this out of the way early doors, um, a lot of the headlines coming out around track limits. Max Verstappen saying he's now lost a Grand Prix victory, a pole position and a point for fastest lap because of track limits. The one interesting thing to come out of all of this of course is that the track limits are being policed where and how they're being policed is written, both in the regulation and in the race director's notes. Where Max contravened the regulation during the race was in the race notes. So there seems to be some disconnect at the moment between Red Bull either not reading the race notes or Max not being made aware of the race notes, or there's some disconnect there because it, it is written down in black and white, or actually in pink and white uh, in Portimao, because if anything has changed over the weekend, it is bold, pink, font so that you uh, you know what's changed. Of course, the easiest way to get around all of this is simply to police track limits at every corner rather than just at a couple. You do it at all the corners and you make the white line the absolute limit of the track. Perhaps that will completely eradicate any area that there might be for confusion. Um, it's also slightly incorrect to say that he's lost a win and the fastest lap point and the pole position because of track limits, you could just as easily argue he's lost it because of a driver error. He made the mistake. He went outside the track limits where he wasn't supposed to. Um, like it's going to rumble along until a stand is taken one way or the other, um, that they either can go and do what the hell they want or the track limits will be policed and policed to the letter at every single corner. Uh, consistency has been requested. So consistency is hopefully what they will get, whether that is strict enforcement or no enforcement. I guess it kind of has to be one or the other. But that shouldn't take away from what was a brilliant win by Lewis Hamilton. Of course, it was Valtteri Bottas who took the pole, couldn't compete in the race, though Lewis just too good for both Max and for Valtteri. Max saying he, he hated the weekend in Portimao, absolutely hated it, hated every lap. 
um, because there was so little grip out there um, and his car didn't like it, he didn't like it. So to come out with a second place, actually a pretty good result for Max and he was pretty happy with that as was Red Bull Racing but Lewis with the win does extend of course his championship lead over Max Verstappen but it's close, it's tight and it's going to ebb and flow um, at every single race track that we go to. Might Max have won if he'd taken pole position? Possibly, arguably. Um, it's it's just brilliant because you don't know which of those two teams is going to have the advantage either from track to track or on any given day um, or on any given tyre at any given track. So uh, yeah, that ebb and that flow is, is wonderful. Between Lewis and Max, Valtteri and Checo, a little bit behind both of their teammates at the moment. Checo still trying to find where he's at with that car. Um, interesting to note as well, Lewis and Valtteri running different rear wings during the uh, Portuguese Grand Prix, which may possibly have accounted for the slight different uh, or differentiation in pace between the two. Uh, so it was Hamilton one, Verstappen uh, came home second, Bottas third, Perez in fourth. Um, a brilliant race weekend overall for Lando Norris, once again, who is being touted very much, of course, as a champion of the future. We know he's supremely talented, but he seems to have just taken it to another level this year. His maturity is rising. He's so on top of the car. He's the, the, the team leader, uh, undeniably, at McLaren right now and doing a wonderful job uh, for the team, particularly on a weekend where Ferrari looked to be the strongest of the midfield outfits. Both of their cars are the top 10, while Daniel Ricciardo struggled and dropped out in Q1, but fought back to ninth place in the race. Daniel told me on Saturday he's still having to be really conscious in the car, really present. He can't relax into it and sort of drive with the unconscious part of his brain. He's, he's you know, he's driving right here rather than back here. And because of that, he's having to draw so much out of himself and concentrate and, and you know, it's an effort to get the lap time out of the car. Whereas for Lando at the moment, it's just natural. Same is true, of course, at Red Bull. You know, for Max, it feels very natural. For Sergio, he's having to be so present, so mindful the whole time. He can't relax into the car and it's holding both of them back. Certainly Daniel drove brilliantly on Sunday, a really battling drive for him up into ninth. Uh, on what ended up being a really good weekend for McLaren, which had looked to be a pretty difficult one, when, as I said, both Ferraris made it into the top 10. Carlos Sainz out-qualifying Charles Leclerc. But Ferrari, in hindsight, made a bit of a boo-boo with the strategy, putting uh, their drivers from the soft onto the medium, the medium dropping at the end of the race and dropping Carlos out of the points. He ultimately came home in 11th place, Charles finishing in P6. Um, uh, something to learn there. Ferrari didn't maximise a weekend where they probably should have taken that advantage from McLaren, uh, but only one point score for Ferrari, so a bit of work to do. Um, but they know where they went wrong, and I'm sure they won't again in the future. A really good weekend, meanwhile, for Alpine. Esteban Ocon coming home in seventh, Fernando Alonso coming home in eighth, despite him not making it through to Q3. Um, but the old Fernando was back in the race, a really battling drive from him, and that was wonderful to see. And for Esteban as well, strong qualifying, strong race. Is it circuit specific, or have they actually managed to unlock the potential within that car? I guess we will find out over the next few rounds. But um, yeah, certainly a big step forward from Alpine last time out in Portimao. Pierre Gasly was P10 with the final point of the day, really on a weekend, a disappointing weekend for Alpha Tauri. Having seen the pace that they had in the opening two races, they just couldn't deliver uh, in Portimao. The track didn't really suit them. The slippery nature of the surface didn't suit them. Um, they wanted more, they expected more, and they will hope to be back, um, you know, fighting to get both cars into the top 10 here in Spain. Um, as we've already said, Sainz finished just outside the points in 11th. Behind them, uh, Giovinazzi qualified 12th, finished 12th in the Alfa Romeo, did a good job all weekend and I think probably got the most out of it that he could and was lucky to escape getting um, a puncture when Kimi Raikkonen drove into the back of him on the opening lap. Kimi admitted he was just looking at his steering wheel, changing a couple of buttons, got caught in the slipstream and off straight into the back of his teammates so uh, not ideal from Kimi um, but Antonio getting away with it 
Uh, it could have been a lot worse for him. Really shocker of a weekend, really shocking shocker of a weekend for Aston Martin. Car was nowhere all the way through. Lance um, had the upgrades on the car. Seb will have them on his car this weekend as well. Um, couldn't unlock it, couldn't unlock the potential. Um, a lot of blank faces staring at a lot of data sheets at Aston Martin last weekend. And Seb somehow pulling out a top 10 qualifying performance. Brilliant job from him. Absolutely phenomenal job from Sebastian Vettel, but just couldn't maintain that pace in the Grand Prix. It's going to be a really hard year for them. As we've said, um, they will continue to struggle in that car. Um, but all is not lost. They will continue to work throughout the year. They're not just going to chuck it in the skip. They will work on it and they will hope to pull something out in the remaining races of the year. Uh, Tsunoda wasn't quite on it this weekend, as we've said. Gasly um, and Alpha Tauri struggling to match their performance over the opening two races. Williams also um, didn't have the pace that they had at uh, uh, Imola, and that was, you know, the conditions of the track really were everything that Williams hates, really everything that car hates. High winds, slippery surface, absolutely not to their liking at all. I was really impressed with Mick Schumacher's run for Haas. Could have been 15th or 16th. Uh, that's kind of the pace he was showing all the way through the weekend. And had he been able to pass Nicholas Latifi earlier in the race, he certainly feels that he could have made his way through the field and possibly even got up and fought with George Russell over that P16, maybe even uh, fighting up towards Sonoda in P15. But um, Mick has taken a step forward um, and looks, you know, completely comfortable in the cup maybe not completely comfortable but more comfortable more at ease and we're starting to see really what Mick Schumacher can bring to the party in a car which as we know uh, is not the best in the field far from it so uh, for him to pull out that performance overtake the Williams and think he could have done more um, I think says a lot about Mick and, and really where he's at um, there were other stories uh, over the weekend in Portimao, an interesting one um, from Zach Brown at McLaren, who sort of delivered a state of the nation open letter about where he sees the sport heading, where he wants to see the sport heading. And in particular, he said what he'd really like to see is a secret ballot, secret vote um, on the F1 Commission when it comes to rule changes. And his reasoning for that is he doesn't want teams who are allied to other teams, who are customers of other teams, being pressured or being forced into having to vote a certain way. Um, an interesting comment from Zach. I don't know if he was implying that maybe the Ferrari teams are all sort of maybe pressured to vote a certain way by, by their engine partner, or maybe the Red Bull teams vote together, or maybe that he feels he was being pressured by Toto Wolff now that he's a Mercedes customer. That was not clear, but Toto and uh, Zach certainly having some, uh, what looked like some quite stern words on the Friday. By Sunday night, it was all very jovial and all very happy. So um, always fascinating to see these things and to see how they unfold. But I don't think it's entirely unreasonable at all. Uh, Zach's suggestion that the vote should be private, the vote should be secret, allow teams to vote for the best interests of their intentions and their desires um, rather than feeling pressured into voting a certain way because of alliances or partnerships. So that was interesting. Um, also news breaking that Monaco has announced that they will have fans in the grandstand for the Grand Prix this year, not just those lucky people that live in the principality that can watch the race from their balconies. Uh, I believe it's about 40% capacity they're going for uh, and everyone needs to have passed a negative PCR test before they are allowed into the grandstands. Uh, there will be fans at the grandstands here in Spain this weekend as well. So uh, that'll be lovely, absolutely wonderful to see fans back at a Grand Prix venue. It's what it's all about. Um, so yeah, bring that on. Can't wait for the Grand Prix this weekend. Oof. That was a long old first link, wasn't it? Shall we move on? Let's move on to the World Endurance Championship, which of course was at Spa for the opening round uh, of their season for the six hours, the very first race in the history of the new hypercar class and a lot of fears that the LMP2s would be quicker than the hypercars and so it proved during practice some thoughts that maybe the LMP2s would be slowed down even further. That was met with a blank refusal. But Toyota 
in their new hypercar managed to uh, lock out the front row regardless Kobayashi in the number seven car with the pole position the first hypercar pole position and looked like he was going to march to the win in the number seven but braking issues saw him uh, slide off the track at the Bruxelles corner uh, at Spa and ultimately come home third handing the victory to the number eight Toyota but it wasn't plain sailing a great battle with the Signatec Alpine which of course is an LMP1 that's been kind of grandfathered into being a, a hypercar but a brilliant battle between those two ultimately saw a Signatec Alpine come home in second as we said the number seven Toyota coming home in third uh, in LMP2 we talked about what a good weekend it was for McLaren in Portimao Zach Brown had uh, a brilliant weekend because his United Autosport car dominated the field in LMP2 Brilliant win ahead of the number 38 Jota car. Uh, the number 28 was in third after getting a late penalty for dangerous driving. Um, but the number 26 G Drive had actually been looking good uh, for that second position for pretty much all of the race, but had to uh, had to abandon their race with about an hour left to run. So, uh, yep, United Auto Sport looking looking really really uh, good in LMP2. Paul De Resta will be back uh, at the team for the next round in Portimao. Uh, in GTE Pro, Corvette took on the might of Porsche and Ferrari but couldn't quite get on the podium in what, as it turned out, was Oliver Gavin's last ever race. The uh, absolute racing legend uh, has announced that he will be hanging up his helmet to start the Driver Academy and uh, wish him nothing but the best after so many years uh, of brilliant racing and joy that he's brought the world of motorsport. Um, yeah, the Corvettes couldn't really hold a candle to the Porsches and the Ferraris, ultimately Neil Janney uh, and Kevin Estray. Janney, of course, having moved down from uh, the top class um, of, uh, of world endurance uh, to the GTE pros, um, no surprise that he took to it like a duck to water to bring home uh, the victory. World Endurance Championship organizers uh, and the ACO uh, have uh, stated that despite the fact there are question marks now over whether fans will be allowed um, at the Le Mans 24 hours, they're not going to reschedule it. Whatever happens now, the Le Mans 24 hours will take place at the end of August, fans or no fans. Um, in other news, Glickenhaus has announced Finally, that the 007 hypercar has been homologated, so we hope we will see them in Portimao. Uh, and in other news, Tatiana Calderon will not be able to race at the next round of Super Formula. Why are we including this in the WEC news? Because obviously she raced um, at Spa and will stay in Europe uh, to race once again uh, at Portimao for the next round. Now, while we're talking uh, endurance racing, uh, we don't normally do bits of, uh, of rumour or news that's to come, but I think we kind of can with this a little bit because IMSA have announced that later on today, and of course it will be, you know, later on today, just after I've recorded this, but later on today they're having a press conference um, with Robert Wickens. Um, now, Marshall Pruitt has reported on Racer, that um, there's the potential for Robert to come back to full-time racing, hopefully in IMSA. And if that happens, it would just be wonderful. I know we don't deal with rumour and all this, but the fact that they have announced this press conference will be happening means um, that something something is happening. Um, Robert, of course, who, who suffered such uh, horrifying injuries in his um, accident at Pocono, uh, in IndyCar in, in 2018, which left him with severe spinal cord damage. Um, to see him back in a racing car would just make my heart sing. So um, fingers crossed that, that is the good news that we all hope it's going to be. In Super GT, a thrilling Fuji 500 kilometer golden week uh, race saw real racings. Uh, Tsukakoshi and Bertrand Baguette take uh, what ultimately was uh, an unlikely and unexpected victory after Tsuboi had a power issue in his Supra and Fukuzumi was handed a drive through penalty for passing under full course yellow. Formula E news now and the uh, city council in uh, Vancouver. Canada uh, have stated and sort of passed a motion uh, saying that they want to hold 
the Canadian round of Formula E. Um, and the Formula E Canadian promoter thinks that's a great idea as well. Um, so there is a massive chance now that Formula E will go to Vancouver and will race uh, on a pretty similar track to that which Champ Car used to run uh, back in Vancouver back in the day. So that would be cracking to see that. Uh, Formula E races on the streets of Monte Carlo this weekend. Some slight alterations to the track, last minute changes. They were going to run the old school first corner at saint devot you know, sort of the slightly faster one, but they've um, put the F1 curbing in, which sort of pulls the corner, the apex back and makes it a much slower corner, which should be better for the, for the regen for the cars. They've also changed the position of um, the, the little, you know, little boost patch thing that they, that they have, um, which will be on the outside coming through Casino Square rather than it was going to be down at the Lowe's hairpin, but uh, instead it's going to be going to be Casino Square. So it'd be great. Uh, they're using the full Grand Prix track for the first time in Formula E in Monaco. Now, as we said, MotoGP was in Jerez where Jack Miller took his first win in five years. And it was a great win, uh, leading a Ducati 1-2 to the chequered flag after longtime race and championship leader Fabio Quartararo dropped from the lead to 13th at the flag, Quartararo admitting after the race he'd suffered an arm pump issue um, and was totally lost as to how he could resolve it in, in you know, real pain. Um, he'd already had an operation on it earlier in his career and it's something which is actually affecting a number of riders this year. Um, race winner Jack Miller had an operation for it um, after Doha. Um, Quartararo's physical condition though was so poor after the race that he was forced to miss the test uh, which followed the next day at Jerez which was topped by uh, Maverick Vinales. Um, Bagnaia, Francesco Bagnaia now leads the championship uh, but he's admitted he can't even bring himself to look at the championship table uh, because if he even considers the fact that he's leading the championship uh, he's worried it will make him ride slower. Uh, in Moto2, uh, Di Gianantonio won for Grassini uh, but it's still Remy Gardner who heads the championship standings while in Moto3, KTM's rookie sensation Pedro Acosta took his third win in a row and now leads the championship by well over double the points of his closest rival. He's absolutely smashing it. NASCAR has announced plans for its 2021 All-Star race. And if uh, Formula One's uh, qualifying, sprint qualifying, all of that stuff is enough sort of mental um, mathematical gymnastics for you, I'm not even going to attempt to explain how the grids are set and inverted and done for this thing. If you want to figure it out, look it up because it's... Um, it's something. Um, it's taking place uh, at the Texas Motor Speedway on June the 13th. Meanwhile, there was a race to be had at the weekend and Carl Busch became the latest winner in 2021 with victory on his birthday in Kansas from Kevin Harvick and uh, Brad Kozlowski. Denny Hamlin could only manage a 12th place finish after hitting the wall whilst in the lead, but he maintains his championship lead from Truex Jr as William Byron moves up to third in the standings. And finally, it was a double header weekend for IndyCar in Texas. Um, the rain ultimately arrived and you can't run at Texas in the rain. And so qualifying was canceled and it was determined that both races would be decided by the championship order. The first race was won by Mr. Consistency, Mr. Texas. Scott Dixon, who has now won, get this, he has won an IndyCar race every year for 19 seasons. How there is any question mark, and I don't think there is anymore, but even if there, if there was, that has to be put in the skip um, over whether Scott Dixon should be viewed as one of, if not the all-time greatest driver in IndyCar history. I mean, his run of championship successes his run of form, winning a race every year for 19 years. I mean, come on. Scott's just, he's next level. He's next level. Um, brilliant win for him in Texas and coming home just behind him, Scott McLaughlin, who I erroneously called Craig. No, Scott is not a former actor in Neighbours. He is uh, an amazing now IndyCar driver. Um, 
to put it into context, coming home second on an oval like the Texas Motor Speedway so soon in an IndyCar career, having crossed over from supercars, it's like, it's like a soccer player reaching the Super Bowl in the NFL. You know, yeah, they're both ball sports, but that's where the similarity ends. It's the same moving from supercars to IndyCar and getting a podium at Texas Motor Speedway. I mean, what a drive. Third place uh, in the race went to Patricio O'Ward, who believed he had a rocket ship underneath him. And so it proved, because in the second race, he monstered to his first ever IndyCar win. And with that win, Zach Brown is true to his word. And we, we said it was a good weekend for Zach Brown. We'll give Patricio a test, a Formula One test at the end of the season in Abu Dhabi. That is signed. That is delivered. That is going to happen. Zach Brown telling me on the uh, Formula One post-race show that obviously they have their drivers secured for the future. So, you know, it's not just for fun. They are obviously weighing up their their their, their, um, uh, their young driver in O'Ward and whether he could potentially move to Formula One at some point. O'Ward saying he's really happy in IndyCar, but you know what? If someone comes knocking for Lando and McLaren suddenly find themselves needing a driver in Formula One, Patricia is doing everything right at the moment. Talking about doing things right, though, there were a number of unhappy drivers um, with the fact that qualifying for the Sunday race didn't take place. There was ample time and opportunity um, with a pretty sparse timetable on the Sunday and beautiful weather. They could have qualified on Sunday morning. A lot of people are unhappy about that, particularly because there was a massive shunt at the back of the field before the race had even started. The green flag flew. The leading drivers took the green flag. Those at the back involved in an almighty shunt, Connor Daly. Um, and this is a good pub quiz question. Who's the only driver in IndyCar history to take the green flag upside down? That's Connor Daly. Um, thankfully, he's okay. But um, yeah, pretty scary moment. And a lot of the drivers thought very, very unnecessary um, because they could and arguably should have qualified that morning. We finished today, though, remembering Bobby Unser, uh, who sadly passed away on Sunday. Um, what a guy. Just... <laughs> There, there perhaps hasn't ever been, nor can there ever be, anybody who so joyously and joyfully exuded the passion of motor racing. Um, his family were and are racers. He was born into it. He lived it. He loved it. He was the master of Pikes Peak long before they tarmacked it. Um, with a deftness of touch and a skill behind the wheel that made him almost unbeatable. Um, he would win the International Race of Champions. He'd win the, the USAC title twice. He would be uh, crowned Indy 500 winner three times in three decades. One of only two drivers to have done that, uh, Rick Mears being the other. Um, Uncle Bobby was loved throughout the world of motor racing and anyone who ever met him or had the, the, the fortune to have spent any time with him couldn't help but leave just bouncing on air because it's what he, this is what he did, this is what he brought to you, just, just absolute unfiltered joy. Um, I was really fortunate and, and, and honoured that he agreed to be in um, my book when I wrote it and, and talking about the hard times in his life and how he'd come through them, losing his brother, but still wanting to go back and race. He, uh, he was so open and raw and emotional. There was no filter to him. There was no, there was, there was no, no lies in him. There was no side to him. He was just pure and so full of joy and love and the sweetest man, but just the most phenomenal racing driver to boot. Um, he lived a good life. He lived a great life. Um, and he will be remembered forever, um, not just for what he achieved on track, 
but for the beautiful soul that he was, the person that he was, um, and all of the smiles and the joy that he created. Um, he was a really good guy.